Hey everyone, welcome back to Landing Model Rockets Episode 2. Today we're going to be talking about several different types of propulsion used at the model scale. So we're going to talk about the idea of using a little liquid engine, a little hybrid engine, and a little solid motor. And before we get started with that, let's just uh, see if we can avoid all of this. Hey Alexa, what's the best type of rocket fuel? I love liquid oxygen. That's, a, that's an oxidizer, that's not a fuel. Alright, well she doesn't really know what she's talking about, so let's get started. So we've all seen the videos of the Falcon 9 booster coming back to the drone ship. We've seen the new Shepard booster coming back to its landing pad. We've even seen small companies like Mastin Aerospace pioneering this stuff for years. And they all use liquid engines. So I feel like a good place to start here is to try the idea of using a liquid engine at the model scale. Obviously there are design changes that might have to be different, but let's see if it would be feasible. My good friend Charlie is a brilliant engineer. He's from MIT, he's worked for SpaceX, and he has built his own bipropellant liquid engine before. I'm going to go ahead and give him a call, and we'll get the lay of the land to see what it might look like to build a liquid engine at the model scale. Okie doke. Hello, Mr. Garcia. Hello, Joe. How's it going? Going great. Yourself? It's going pretty well. So we're here today because I need some advice on building a liquid engine for my model rocket that I'm trying to land. Yeah. So first off, um, building a re liquid rocket engine is a complex and dangerous endeavor, and you better know what you're getting into. Uh, there's no guarantees when you're doing this. Even the professionals blow up rocket engines, like, literally all the time. Uh, so if you're going to do this, please be careful and be responsible for your own safety. And if you think I said something, uh, you should double-check it with textbooks, industry experts, and common sense before you apply it to your own rocket program. Okay, with that out of the way, we can talk about at a high level what safety concerns go into a rocket engine. So let's uh, let's say you're brand new to rocketry here, and you're going to get started, and you want to know what infrastructure do you need to build a liquid engine. That sounds like me. And liquids are fascinating because they have the most infrastructure associated with them, but then the lowest recurring cost per test. But at the end of the day, when you like break it down, what you need to run a liquid engine test campaign is a test cell, and this test cell needs to provide high pressure fluids to your liquid engine, it needs to be able to collect a ton of data from your engine, and it also needs to be encased in enough concrete so that when your liquid engine inevitably rapidly disassembles itself in a ball of flame, everything that you paid a lot of money for on the ground support infrastructure side is okay. Now, I think that may be a little bit more than what we're trying to do. So I'm trying to work at, I'm not sure if you can see back here, but the scale of, I have my little meter tall electron rocket. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you're going to make a couple of decisions differently from if you were building a full-scale liquid engine like you were SpaceX or Blue Origin. Yeah. So the first thing is you're going to use pyro valves. You don't have weight to do anything else. Okay. Uh, this means that you're going to lose the ability to throttle your engine, and you're also going to lose the ability to um, shut down your engine, but it'll save you a ton of weight and a ton of complexity. Wait, so, wait hold up. You said I'm going to lose the ability to throttle, but that's like, yeah. that's like half the point. Well, you know... You can add a you can add a tuning orifice upstream that you control with the servo. Oh right, would that work with like a getting, ball valve? Getting the too? butterfly valve to seal well will be difficult at cryogenic temperatures. So you basically just use the butterfly valve as like a trimmable orifice to control mass flow, and you use that to throttle. Okay, well that's a little bit extra mass, but I'm sure it'll be worth it. I mean, the reason we choose liquid is we want to be able to throttle these motors, right? Um, all right, so what else should I be thinking about here? So let's say I want to do I don't know what does SpaceX use? We've got kerosene and oxygen. I can get those, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, if I were you, though, I would definitely choose ethanol and liquid oxygen. Uh, ethanol is a much easier cooling problem to solve because you can dilute it with water and it still works very effectively. Okay, so we've got ethanol and oxygen, and uh, yeah. both of those are pretty safe things to work with, right? Uh, so oxygen has some special handling considerations. You're going to make sure that your tanks are very clean. Um, if you had some hydrocarbon contaminants inside of your tanks and your tanks are relatively warm, when you first introduce liquid oxygen into the system, there's a possibility that you could have a, a catastrophic uh, flash. Uh, you could flash the propellant and it could auto-ignite. Uh, that'd be bad. Is that uh, when you get something fixes. called like a def deflagration wave? Yep, yep. exactly. Uh, basically, the contaminants combusting with liquid oxygen would then be sufficient to light the metal structure of your rocket on fire. Um, and then you'd be burning your aluminum with your liquid oxygen, which would be bad. That would be, uh, um, that would be suboptimal, I think. 
<laughs> exactly. Luckily, it's easy to avoid this rocket-rich combustion phenomenon by uh, just wiping everything down with acetone and a lint-free uh, wipe beforehand. Okay, I've uh, got some of those. We can definitely work with that. I'm thinking so far this seems like a realistic idea. Have we thought about mass yet and how much you know how much plumbing is going to need to be lifted into the air? That kind of thing. There's there's going to be a lot of systems associated with this. You're going to need some check valves to. Uh, keep uh, your your any potential flashbacks from happening and also to load propellants into the vehicle. Uh, you're gonna need to decide uh, what your risk stance is going to be. So do I need redundant components for everything or can I accept uh, that this vehicle will be uh, not even single fault tolerant? Can you give me an uh, example of what single fault versus multi-fault tolerant would be? Well, I would guess that you're probably not even going to be single fault tolerant. Uh, so, so there's there's no fault tolerant where any fault on the vehicle will instantly lead to a rapid unscheduled disassembly. Uh, this is not a very common position in industry because you've got a billion dollar satellite on a hundred million dollar rocket and another valve is cheap and light compared to blowing up your satellite. Uh, but for the scale of rocket you're looking at, really you don't have the weight to put another valve on your rocket. So uh, no fault tolerant means that if anything goes wrong, the rocket explodes. One fault tolerant means that any one thing can go wrong and the rocket won't blow up. And then there's two fault tolerant or multi fault tolerant where um, hypothetically you have lots of options. So if you're one fault tolerant, you maybe continue with the mission. By the time your second fault happens, you start looking for graceful abort options. Like, should I punch out or should I like try and land or should I start heading home early? Mm -hmm. Things like that. This is very common in manned space flight, or sorry, crude space flight. Well, anyway, so I guess we're no, we're no fault tolerant, which means everything has to work every single time. For a liquid rocket engine, your primary safety concern is going to be the complexity. This is something that isn't thought of often enough, but basically, a liquid rocket engine just has a lot more bits and bobs and moving parts that you need to think about in detail to understand all the ways they can go wrong. All of these are things that you just have to think about, and it's not necessarily that any one of them in and of itself is more dangerous than a solid or a hybrid, it's just that the complexity of a liquid means that the density of potential failures is very high. There's a lot of potential failure points per cubic inch of rocket engine that you have to think about. And then, kind of on the topic of that, a lot of the things you have to think about. First, cryogenics. Uh, I think liquid oxygen is objectively the safest choice for a uh, amateur liquid rocket engine. You need to think about cryos. Uh, liquid oxygen expands about 800 times uh, between its liquid and its gas phase. Uh, this means that you uh, should be looking for any trapped cavities inside your design. Is there anywhere where you can uh, close off a volume of liquid oxygen? Because that will see tons and tons of pressure if you do that. Uh, every potentially sealed cavity needs to have a vent on it. Um, high pressures, we're talking pressures in excess of 600 PSI. Depending on your engine design, you could see well north of 3,000 PSI. Everywhere that sees this pressure just needs to be rated for these pressures and tested, remember, uh, some way safely to make sure it's rated for those pressures. One of the things you'd be worried about is flammable vapors, especially if you're working with something cryogenic. Uh, you could see a uh, circumstance where if you have the vent for your liquid oxygen and the vent for your ethanol tank uh, near each other, you could accidentally mix these vapors and you could create a fuel-air mixture uh, that is accidentally at the right concentrations for it, to simul uh, to, for it to detonate or deflagrate around the vehicle. Or for example, if you were to chill in the engine, which is a very common practice, you basically pre-fill it with liquid oxygen so everything gets cold before it starts up. Um, Maybe then you get a cloud of liquid oxygen around the base of your rocket, and maybe if some ethanol leaked out during filling, now you've got uh, your propellants very close to each other. If you notice on the Delta IV, they actually light sparklers before every launch to burn off all the excess hydrogen, because hydrogen is so small, it will just leak through their fuel tanks. Even though it's made of metal, it'll just interstitiate through the metal and, and then leak, uh, which is kind of ridiculous. Yeah. Um, Hydrogen's crazy. Um, definitely you have a lot of seals to be worried about, uh, so you should be, every potential joint is a place where you could have a leak. Uh, if you looked at the Japanese Momo 2 rocket that flew a few months ago, um, it had a fuel leak that basically killed the vehicle because then uh, fuel was burning outside of where it was supposed to be. So there's just a lot of things to think about with liquid rocket engines, and if you don't have experience working with these designs, you may not think of all of them before you accidentally learn the hard way. Okay, so we've got a bunch of safety concerns. Let's say I'm still thinking of doing it. I guess, what's your advice for me if I'm still thinking of doing a liquid engine with no prior experience in liquid engines? So just to kind of bottom line it for you here, you're looking at spending about $2,000 at least before you even get your first test off the ground to develop infrastructure. You're going to need a test site with a landowner who's okay with you 
operating rocket engines on that facility. And then you're going to need to put in a lot of engineering thought, and this is disciplined, rational thought, thinking every possible failure scenario through the propellant tanks, the feed system, the injector, the cooling. And you need to make sure that you understand all the parts that go into this. And even then, after you've fully understood the engine, there's still something you haven't thought of, so you're going to blow the first couple of them up. So I would just plan on at least blowing two of them up. I feel like maybe two of them is is a conservative estimate, but yes. <laughs> All right, so I'm not sure that a liquid engine is the best choice right now. And actually, I have an idea. Um, I know that hybrids are a thing too. And so maybe I can save a little bit of money. I can save a lot of complexity if I take one of these liquids out of the equation and then just have a hybrid engine. Like I can still throttle it. What are What do you think? Joe... Hybrids have all the complexity of a liquid with none of the benefits. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks a bunch for your time, Charlie. Thanks a bunch for the advice. I'm going to take this into consideration, and uh, we'll see what comes out. Awesome. <laughs> all right. Thanks. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. So my main concerns now are complexity, safety, and cost. Putting aside those first two, let's just check out cost for a second. I'm going to head to my bank account, and let's see how feasible this really is. Well, um, okay, I think we should probably try to scale this down a little bit. So let's think about a hybrid engine. A hybrid engine has a piece of solid propellant, and then you have some liquid that flows through it. So we're reducing some of the complexity, right? And you can still throttle it. So ideally, this should be a perfect solution. Last summer, my friend Johnny actually built one of these things and tested it at the scale we're working at. I'm going to go ahead and give him a call and see what he has to say about it. Hey, Johnny. Hey, what's up, Joe? How are you doing? Good. How are you? Doing good. So I just had a chat with uh, our good friend Charlie Garcia about liquid engines, and I'm feeling a little bit like maybe uh, they're going to be a little expensive for me. They seem like they're a little bit complicated, too. Um, and I know that you've done some work with hybrid engines, so I was looking to get your take on them. Yeah, for sure. Whatever you need. All right, cool. So I guess the first thing to start with is can you tell me a little bit about what your project was and what you were trying to do? Sure. So what I was trying to do is basically exactly what you were trying to do. The whole goal was model rocket landing at model rocket scale, and then ideally, eventually, at model rocket prices. Um, so I kind of I thought about solids. I did a bunch of modeling with solids. I moved on, maybe thought about liquids, and I was like, mm, it's, uh, it's going to be difficult at model scales. And then I eventually just settled on hybrids. Like, this is probably the only thing that can work at this scale. I found some research that seems to indicate that you could do, like, throttleable, restartable hybrids um, mm -hmm. with cheap components. So I basically went forward with that research and tried to do it myself. Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit more about the engine? Sure, yeah. So basically the engine was a hybrid rocket engine with uh, ABS as the fuel, ABS plastic, 3D printed, um, 3D printed up with you know one core in the middle. And then uh, the oxidizer was nitrous oxide, or N2O. Uh, okay. And basically the idea is N2O, throttle valve in the middle, and then combustion chamber and the fuel grain down below. Right, right. Okay, so that sounds great. So um, one of the things that I wasn't so psyched about with the liquid stuff is the cost. It seemed like it was kind of expensive. Um, what did that look like for you? Uh, basically, I would say if you're doing hybrids, you're probably going to end up spending about as much as you're going to spend doing liquids, um, maybe even a little bit more. <laughs> Well, okay, so one of the things that Charlie talked about was building a big test stand that you could, you know, put a lot of force into. I know that's something you did, too. Couldn't you just do a bunch of, uh, like, CFD or something like that to find out how the motor burns and avoid all of this expensive testing? You know, you'd hope so, but basically rocket engine CFD, and particularly hybrid rocket engine CFD, is basically non-existent. So you ha there are some programs that allow you to do liquid rocket engine CFD, but because in hybrid rocket engines you're dealing with both solids and liquids and things that are changing state all the time, like nitrous oxide, mm -hmm. um, you basically end up having a completely intractable CFD situation going on. Yeah. So you can't model. You really can't model with hybrids. It's really, it's a, it's a damn shame, <laughs> but there, there's really no uh, well-known models that predict your performance at all. So really it just comes down to build the thing, build a test stand for it. All right, so the cost seems like it's still going to be a bit of a problem, but the complexity should be better, right? I mean, it, this should be an easier thing. We're removing one of the liquid components, and we're only dealing with one liquid and one solid. Like, shouldn't that be easier plumbing-wise? 
You th- you'd think so. At the end of the day, basically, you've got a bunch of high pressures. You've got uh, systems that need to be safety rated. So, I mean, if they're if if you're working with nitrous, everything has to be three thousand psi rated, and that just gets expensive. So that's that's where your cost goes. Right. Um, and then the complexity isn't that much different from a liquid. And in some ways, because you can't model it as easily as you can as a liquid, uh, the complexity can actually be a bit worse in some in some ways. Here and there, I'm sure it is a bit easier than liquids because you know you don't have to worry too much about like hard starts. You don't need to worry about a lot of things that liquids have to worry about. But there's a lot of bad things that come with that. So ignition in general is just harder to get going. You know, liquid systems, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward to actually get ignition in hybrids it's pretty hard to start ignition. Right, okay, I guess so we're, we're basically just like divvying up all of the complexity rather than getting rid of any of it. All right, so it seems like the cost is still an issue. Um, surprisingly, it seems like the complexity is still a pretty big thing. Um, I guess my next question is, I know you used uh, nitrous oxide for your oxidizer in your hybrid engine. Um, what are like my safety concerns here? Is this a safe thing to work with? You know, should I be concerned? You should be very concerned, very, very concerned. Yeah, so nitrous is definitely not a safe thing to be just playing around with, um, especially in large quantities and at high pressure. Uh, bad, bad things can happen. So take 10 minutes and go Google some some of the bad things that have happened with nitrous, and you will respect it, or you should. <laughs> uh, so a lot of the work that I did just went into building safety systems. So you know, electronic systems, passive systems, procedures that basically enabled me to work with this stuff safely. Um, that was like 90% of the effort went into safing this whole. Really? So, so like most of the effort was into just keeping yourself and your equipment safe as opposed to actually building the rocket? Pretty much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> I know you used uh, a couple of different systems to keep all of your stuff safe. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? For sure, yeah. So I had uh, a big distributed computer system, basically. A bunch of Arduinos and a bunch of Raspberry Pis all working together to keep this thing safe and to log up the data, etc. So uh, all this code that I did for like six months straight is all on GitHub. So if anybody wants to you know, try and reverse engineer it, feel free. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> we'll, put, we'll put that in the uh, description. Yeah. Yes, down below. All right, well, thanks so much for your time, Johnny. This is really helpful. Um, Seems like actually hybrids end up being a lot more complicated than they might seem like on the surface. Seems like Mm -hmm. they're kind of equal to liquids, actually. Um, And uh, I guess that's all. We're going to look at solids next, I think. For sure, yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, like Charlie always says, hybrids are all of the problems of liquids and none of the benefits. (laughs) (laughs) Good luck with the solids. Yeah, thanks so much, man. I'll talk to you soon. (laughs) All right, cheers. All right, bye. All right, so we've got liquid engines, we've got hybrid engines. Both of them seem pretty complicated, kind of dangerous, and pretty cost prohibitive. So the next option is solid motors. Now, I will say I'm cheating a little bit because this is episode two, and in the previous one, we actually covered how it's totally possible to land with a solid motor. But what if you wanted throttle control, right? You know, that's kind of the main concern here is how are you going to throttle these motors? Let's say that something in the last episode was wrong and that the simulation does not actually work the way I think it does. In order to entertain the idea that I might be wrong about this, I'm going to go ahead and open up a CAD program and demonstrate what I think might be the solution for throttling solid motors. I'm using Onshape here, but it really doesn't matter what CAD program you use. The best tool is the one you know well. Okay, so I have a model of the Falcon Heavy here, and that's actually not what we're interested in. We just need to see the base of the rocket. So one second here. Okay, so we've got the center core of the Falcon Heavy here, and it really doesn't matter what rocket we're using. I'm just using this to demonstrate and visualize what I'll be talking about here. So the goal, again, is to land a model rocket propulsively, and we've decided that solid propellant is probably the best way to do it. It's also worth noting at this point, I'm not doing any of this because it's practical or because it makes sense. I'm just outlining the process by which you can definitely land a model rocket with solid propellant at a reasonable scale for not a ton of money. But this is a rough mock-up of like what the bottom of the vehicle looks like, and I think this will give us a good idea of how we can land and sort of throttle solid motors. Now, I, I say throttle with quotes because that's not actually what we're doing. What we really want to do is just augment the total impulse of the retropropulsive motor. And if that sounds crazy, don't worry about it. Let me explain this. So basically, you have a certain amount of energy that you want to spend within a certain amount of time to land the rocket. And you have, you know, some leeway in terms of like, how, how hard do you want to touch the rocket down on the ground and like if you're willing to accept a hop. But let's say that you're not willing to accept any of that and you want even more control than just knowing how high your rocket's going to generally go and how hard your rocket is generally going to burn on the way down. 
So in an ideal world, what we would do is actually throttle the solid propellant. And there are sort of ways to do this, but at the model scale, we're sort of working with engines like this. This is one of these F-15 engines that I talked about in the last video. And what we also saw in the last video is that you can get very close with just one of these engines. However, the concept that I'm about to show you here actually involves five separate landing motors. So you have what we'll just assume is an F-15. This is your main retro booster. So the F-15 is gonna go right in this highlighted part here. This is the central motor mount, and this is where both our ascent and retro motor will go eventually. The F-15 is gonna be doing most of the work to land this rocket, but it will not be doing all of the work because it will be assisted by four outboard, very small A or B level motors on the outside of the rocket. These little tiny motors can provide just a little bit of impulse to correct for any inconsistencies in the main booster, which is the F-15. And so in this CAD model, you can see there are spots between each one of the landing legs where one motor could basically sit facing downward. These motors don't have to be thrust vector controlled. They don't have to be super fine tuned. They just have to sit there and spend a little bit of propellant to augment the thrust of the F-15. And so going back a little bit, why would you want to underspec the F-15 motor when you could just have it do all the work? Well, we live in an imperfect world, and the F-15 in my hand right now isn't going to perform identically to any other F-15 in the market. It might be a little bit stronger than some, it might be a little bit weaker than some, or it might be right around the average. And so in this scenario here, while the main F-15 is burning, the flight computer can analyze the Z-axis acceleration data on the vehicle. And so long as the flight computer knows the mass of the vehicle, it can analyze how closely the F-15 on board is performing to the expected results of an actual F-15. So we're really far into the weeds here and we're almost out. It's time to bring it home. As this F-15 is burning and as the flight computer is analyzing its performance, it can decide whether to burn either two or four of these A-level motors on the way down. And so this couples with why we underspect the F-15 motor, because in an ideal scenario, the F-15 overperforms and we don't have to burn any of the outboard motors to give it a little bit more thrust and slow it down a little bit more. In a scenario where the F-15, which is underspec, performs nominally, we would have to burn two of the outboard A or B level motors. They would be located right here and right here, and those would help augment the thrust, which was not quite enough from the F-15 to land the vehicle. In a scenario where the F-15 motor does not perform nominally and is actually subnominal or worse performance, less thrust than we expect, we can burn all four of these little outboard A level engines. Okay, so this video is lasting forever, and this is a lot of information. And I guess the best way that I can end this, the best way I can sort of leave a good ending note here is to say, there is no right way to do this. There are only lots and lots of different, very hard ways to do this. So I've outlined a bunch of ways you can do it. It is possible to do it with a liquid engine. It is possible to do it with a hybrid engine. But both of those options require that you have lots of experience, lots of safety equipment, lots of time to spend, lots of money to spend, and the willingness to blow a lot of things up. In the meantime, I will still be trying to propulsively land rockets with one F-15 motor in the center, just a solid non-throttleable motor without these outboard solutions. If the project gets to a point where it just doesn't seem possible to do this with one non-throttled solid motor, we can add these four outboard motors on the outside to augment the thrust and get a lot more control and precision in our landings. All right, congratulations for making it to the end of the video. This was certainly a long one. Uh, thank you so much to Johnny and Charlie for their time and expertise. The link for Johnny's control software is down in the description below. And thank you so much to the folks who are supporting BPS.Space on Patreon. All this hardware and software and all of these videos, none of these would be possible without the people who are helping BPS on Patreon, and I'm really grateful for their support. If you'd like to help out, there's a link to the Patreon in the description down below. And if you don't want to, no worries. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds be low.